we're going to continue on this morning looking at marriage. Over the past couple of weeks, we started talking about marriage. We've been looking at Ephesians chapter uh, chapter five for the last couple of weeks, and you know, we started we started talking about um, whose whose idea was marriage? Was it man's idea? Or was it God's idea? Uh, we identified right that it was God's idea. It was instituted by God, and we know that because looking at Genesis chapter two. When God had created Adam, and he, he said, says that he looked and, and saw that it was not good that man should be alone. Uh, so that he said that he would create him, for him a helpmate who is comparable to him. Um, and then we know that God placed Adam in a, in a deep sleep and then took a rib from Adam. And from that rib, he formed woman. And Adam said, this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. And she should be called woman, right? Because she was taken from man. And then it tells us that that the man is to leave the father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And You know, we see in that passage of Scripture, that is the institution of marriage, right? So we know that marriage was God's plan, His design. And we know that God had a design for it, right? That He had an order to it. And we talked about how, you know, when we line ourselves up in marriage with God's plan, with His will, what we see, when we do it God's way, right, and not our way, when we do it God's way, we see that God blesses it, he strengthens it. He renews it. You know, he, he, he brings great peace and joy to it when we're doing it his way. But where man gets it wrong is we start, we start wanting to do it our way and not God's way. So, you know, what we talked about last week is we started looking at what that order is. What is God's plan for marriage? And we started talking with the wife's role in marriage. Uh, we talked about that word submission, right? And, and how that, you know, society has taken that word and and made it a bad word, but it's not a bad word. It's, it's, it's God's word, all right? It's God's plan, His way. And, um, and, and it's not that, listen, submission doesn't give the husband the right to, to uh, be a dictator in the relationship or to rule over uh, the wife with an iron fist, okay? That's not what he's talking about in regards to submission, right? When, when he's talking about submission, that word submission means that you put yourself underneath an authority, well, we talked about how in order to do that, and for, to appropriately for a wife to submit to the husband, she first needs to submit to Jesus. Amen. And that's what Paul says in, in verse 22 of chapter 5. He says, you know, he says, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. You see, there's no true submission to the husband from the wife unless the wife is first submitted to the husband, I mean, to, the, to Jesus. So it's that relationship thing. We, and that's the same for us husbands. We talked about that just a little bit. We're going to be looking at a little bit deeper uh, detail today about when we are to love our wives as Christ loved the church. Listen, we are to first submit ourselves to God and put ourselves underneath his authority, his plan, his, the way he designed it to be. Right? If this relationship here is off, then our relationships here horizontally are going to be off. Okay, so we need to get our hearts right with God. We need to make sure that we're lining ourselves up with the will and the plan of God, doing it God's way. So today we're going to look at we're going to look at the husband. Okay, what is his role in that relationship of marriage? All right. So if you're not already there, please turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter five. Uh, we're going to be looking at verses twenty five through twenty eight. Um, and while you're turning there, I just want to give a, the men a quick um, just some quick advice. Uh, this is some marriage. Marital advice that a good friend of mine gave me um, years ago, and he told me, he said, Randy, if it's not funny now, it's not going to be funny on the way home, all right? And uh, that's, you know, if you didn't write that down, man, you need to write it down. That's important, okay? Uh, I still, huh? Did I say it right? If it's not funny now, it's not... funny on the way home, it's not funny now, so that's Okay, so I messed it up. I do that all the time. But anyways... Anyways, I still get that wrong because Nick is telling me all the time. She's like, man, you went for the laugh, didn't you? <laughs> all right, because, you know, I'd... anyways. All right, so <laughs> in Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to be looking at verses 25 through 29 this morning. All right, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to start reading. Um, and we're going to stop and talk after we, you know, after I read a passage. We're going to stop and talk about it a little bit and pick up on the next verse, okay? Uh, but starting with verse 25, the Apostle Paul says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ has also, also loved the church and gave himself for her. You know, when I looked at those words, just as, I can tell you, I, mean, I, was, being, I was getting beat up by those words this week as I was looking at this passage of scripture. You know, because he says, love your wives just as Jesus loved the church. And, 
gave himself up for it. It's not like, you know, we can just take a piece here and a piece there and say, well, you know, if I'm doing this okay, then, you know, I'm, I'm okay. No, he's saying just as Christ loved the church, we are to love our wives. And that's speaking, listen, he says here, you know, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it. That's not, listen, it's not that Jesus just loved the church, so he gave his life for the church. We got to look about at, at what Jesus did from the time of his birth to the time of his crucifixion and resurrection. Man, you know, Jesus did more for us than just die for the cross, on the cross for it. He did that. But when, when Paul is speaking on this passage of Scripture, he's not saying that, listen, it's just enough for us to be willing to take a bullet for our wives. Okay? It's not enough just for us to be willing to throw ourselves on a grenade for them. Okay? It's, it's more than that. He, what he's talking about is we need to love our wives the way that Christ loved the church and gave himself up from it, for it. Meaning that, listen, we're to take on that role and position in our life, in our marriages, that, 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 that following that example that Christ has put for us in regards to his relationship with the church. I mean, we talked about how, you know, that the marriage is, it's an it's a, it's a image of what our relationship with God should be. I mean, God designed marriage to represent and resemble that, mar that marriage between the church and Christ. And what, what are we looking at here when we think about how Jesus loved the church and gave himself up for it? When we're talking about it, it says that, you know, we, we talked about this last week. Therefore, just as this is in verse 24, um, therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. That means that, listen, we are to take on that role as men. We're to take on that role and position as leaders in our families. But, but you know, we got to, I feel like that in our society, we got this distorted view of what that looks like. There's a lot of men who take that leadership role and think that that gives them the authority to be dictators in their homes. Well, can I tell you, that's not following the example of Christ. Amen. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, Jesus says, he says, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Uh, that, that, that was, those were Christ's words. That's the example that we are to follow in leadership. So when we're talking about leadership in our, in our homes and following the example of Christ, then we need to place ourselves in a servant leadership position, willing to sacrifice for our wives, willing to give of ourselves to our wives. Can I tell you that, that Jesus, it tells us in John chapter 1, we see this picture of who Jesus is. In John chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, it says, And the word, of, and the word um, was with God, and the word was God, right? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And then later on in verse 13, it says, The word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Can I tell you that Jesus was, before he entered on this earth as a, as a baby, he was king in, in, in glory, seated on his throne, Amen. on high. But yet he chose to leave glory, leave heaven, and dwell amongst sinful man. Can I tell you, what, what, what act of sacrifice was that, church? I mean, to, to leave complete perfection to come to humanity where we are in a fallen state, a fallen nature, but yet Jesus chose to come and dwell amongst men. And that, that, that passage right after it says, it says that and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That is Jesus, right? I mean, he, he was in the beginning with God, but he was also God. He was God, right? And he clothed himself with flesh and we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. But we see this picture of Jesus in his being a servant to the church. And, and he had every right to take the position as Lord and King over the church. I mean, he had every right to come in a ruler's position with authority, with power, and with might, but yet he submitted himself to the Father's will and came and as a servant. And hus husbands, when, when Paul is speaking to us here and he's talking about we are to love our wives just as Christ has loved the church and gave himself for her. Listen, we are to be willing to lay down our lives for our wives, absolutely, but we are also have to be willing. We have to be willing to come alongside of our wives and be servants to them. And I, I'm not talking about, well, the wife is to submit to the husband, his leadership, 
But we need to be sensitive and understanding of their needs and their wants. If you would, just for a moment, turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3. And I want to read to you what, the, uh, what Peter has to say about the husband's role. In 1 Peter chapter 3. Give me an amen when you get there. Amen. In verse 7 of chapter 3 of 1 Peter it says, Husbands, likewise dwell with them, their wives, with understanding. And I know what you're thinking, men. You're thinking, Randy, for real? I mean, you're just telling me that, or you just told me that I, I have to love my wives as Christ loved the church. Now you're telling me I have to live with them in, with understanding? I mean, for the men, women, that could be difficult, okay? Just so you don't, if, if you don't know that, all right? Because, you know, men and women, we're different. Right? Amen. I mean, we think differently. We have, you know, we act, react to emotions differently. We're just different. But yet Peter is saying that we are to live with our wives with understanding. But then he says, giving honor to the wife. And that word honor actually speaks to as, as if you were paying a great price for something of great worth and value. So, men, let me put it to you this way and, and try to give this analogy to you. Let's say that you have this one particular thing that you've been wanting desperately, really bad, and you've been saving up for it for a long period of time, and you've been saving a little bit here, a little bit here, and finally you get enough to purchase that thing, and you buy it, and it's a great amount of money, and you spend all this money on it. What do you do with it? Do you go and take it then and throw it in a drawer? Do you throw it on the ground? Do you kick it around? Do you, what do you do with it? No, whatever that thing is that is precious and dear to you, you put it in a place that that you can protect it, right? Keep it in, in good shape. You don't want it to be hurt. You don't want it to be broken. When we give honor to our wives, husband, that's, what we are, that's how we are to treat our wives. As if we had played, prayed such a great price for this. It's something of great value and great worth. Man, we're, we should have the want and the desire to, to put it, to, to keep our wives in such honor and, and to place them in, in a place in our lives and and, and how we value them and, and hold that value in a high place and a high standard in our lives. And, and to want to cherish them, to not hurt them, to not break them. Our wives are different from us in the manner of, listen, they want our care and our attention. They need it. They need to know that they're safe when they're with us. I thought I would get an amen from the wives on that one. Amen. But, <laughs> but then he says, he says, as to the weaker vessels. As to the weaker vessels. Now, women, that's not speaking that, saying, you know, Paul, Peter's not saying that the woman is weaker, right, in mind. It, she's weaker in physical stature, okay? She's weaker than the male. But this is given that authority, that position of what it is to be a husband, to be the protector of the wife. We are to watch over and guard our wives, protect them, not, and not just physically, but emotionally as well. You know, I have I've done counseling in the past and seen how, how you can tell, you don't have to get in a conversation very long with them before you can realize, man, that there's been some verbal abuse from the husband to the, to the wife. And you know, and, 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 it's, and it's those verbal abuses that, that stuff, man, that sticks. I mean, the, listen, bruises, cuts, scars, those things, they heal, they go away. But man, the emotional scars, the emotional hurts, that's, that's what lasts. Husbands, we're not loving our wives as Christ loved the church, just as Christ loved the church, if we are abusing our wives emotionally. Verbally and physically. But we are to hold our wives with great honor as if they are great value to us. We are to nourish and, cher and, and cherish them, provide for them. That is the role of the husband. But then we'll just finish it up here with 1 Peter. He says, as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Being heirs together. That means equal heirs. Um, church. That, that means that listen. In the position of grace and mercy. That we receive from Christ Jesus. That position. It, that We're on equal playground. Okay. 
The word of God tells us in Galatians that there is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male or female, but we are all one in Christ Jesus. So when we look at that role of a husband and a wife, knowing that we are equal heirs together of the grace of life, that, that should tell us, men, that we should not place ourselves in that position of dictatorship over our wives, but that we should come alongside of them as joint heirs in the grace of life. You know, I always tell, when I'm doing premarital counseling, I always tell the couple that, listen, if, you, if, you, if your heart's desire is to meet the needs of your spouse and their, needs, their desire is to meet your needs, what you're going to find out is your needs being met. It, it, this relationship of marriage is not meant to be, it's not a selfish act. It's a selfless act. It's a sacrifice one unto another. Seeking to meet the needs of the other. That's what Christ did for the church. Jesus humbled himself. It, Jesus says, listen, birds of the air, they have nests to sleep in. The foxes, they have holes to sleep in. But the man, son of man doesn't even have a place to lay his head. Jesus wasn't seeking, out there to seek, um, place himself as in this high position over everyone. He came as a servant. And man, if we could just understand that and grasp that in our marriages. It's not about, listen, that role as a husband, as being the leader of his home, doesn't give us the right to, uh, to verbally abuse our wives or our children or to be harsh. and It gives us the right to submit ourselves first to God. And, and God has given us the gift, the ability to lead our families in that manner, in that way that Christ led the church. And gave himself up for it. Apostle Paul goes on to say, if you would turn back to Ephesians chapter 5. When he talks about this selfless act of what it is to... To be in that position of, 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 of that being in that role of a husband. I want to just jump down to verse 28. In verse 28, he says, So husbands are to, ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes, cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. I want to, I want to ask you, Man, I mean, when you're hungry, what do you do? You eat, right? I mean, when you're tired, what do you do? Well, you get some sleep. Right? When you have an itch, you scratch it. Right? You take care of your needs. In the same way, we are to take care of the needs of our wives. Be willing to, to put their needs even above our own needs. And that is the same for the wife when she is... Submitting herself to her husband, she's putting his needs over hers. And when you do that, like I said, man, what you see, what you find is your needs are being met. That's the order that God has put in order for marriages. <coughs> and, and if we could just get that, church, I'm telling you, we would see our marriages being strengthened. We would see our marriages growing. We would see our marriages becoming more like what our relationship with the Lord should represent. Amen. Paul says, and I read this to you last week or the week before in verse 32. He says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Uh, I mean, wait, I mean, Paul's addressing the wife and the husband, right? But see, he's also addressing the church. And he's saying that that role in that position of the wife and how she is to submit to her husband, giving him that place of leadership, that we, the church, are to submit to Christ in the same way, giving him the leadership, the headship over our, over our lives. Because when we talk about the church, right, we're not talking about this church building, right? I mean, this church building is, is, is nothing but concrete, wood, and metal. When the Bible is speaking about the church, it's speaking about you and me, about the body of Christ. Jesus says, I am the head and that you are the body. We are the body of Christ. We are the church. So when it talks about this being this, this image, this picture of marriage, of 
Christ in the church. Last week I had made the point that, listen, God started in the Bible with a marriage and He ends in the Bible with a marriage, right? In Genesis, we see that we see the marriage of Adam and Eve, that institution of marriage, right, for, for man and woman. But at the end of the book, right, in Revelations, we see that institute, that marriage of Christ in the church, that we are the bride of Christ. And we are to submit underneath his authority, submit to God. But then as husbands, we are to take on that role in that position, following the example of Christ Jesus, and walking out our marriage, being led by the example that has been given to, to us through Christ, that He came as a servant leader, that He led by example, right? And that is the position that we are to take in, in, our, in our marriages as husbands. That, that listen, we are to lead by example. You know, we can't effectively lead in our households if all we do is we say one thing but we do another. Okay? If we're going to be effective in our leadership positions as husbands and as fathers, then we need to make sure that what we say we do. That we back it up. I mean, Jesus backed it up. <laughs> Jesus backed it up. We are to back it up, not, not to just say one thing and, and do another. And that is a sacrifice, men. We are to sacrifice for our family. Give of ourselves to our families. God instituted the family. In fact, that was the first institution that He put in place in Scripture. You know, I've had people tell me before that if I put my family before the ministry that God has given me, then I've, then I've got it out of order. But I, I, my outlook on that is, no, I don't have it out of order. I've got it in the order that God designed. It's first my family and then it's the ministry. It's not that I put God underneath my family. I, my relationship with God is first. It's God... It's family, and then it's everything else. Amen. And it should be that that should be the order for which we live out our lives together as a family unit. Jesus, when he was asked what his purpose was, he always said, "I've come to do the will of my Father." Always. We see that Jesus, Jesus. Made that gave us that example of putting the Father first. But then he talks about how he talks about his disciples and all his followers and about how he prayed for them and how he, he nurtured them and he cared for them. And that gives us the example of how we are to how we are to care and nourish and cherish our families. I feel like that we the struggles that we have in our marriages so often is because we've got our priorities all wrong. We've got it out of order. It's out of whack. But we're not going to see our marriages being strengthened and, and growing if we don't line it up with the will and plan of God. And that's what Paul is speaking to in Ephesians chapter 5. Church and and, and, you know, I, I truly, there again, I just truly believe that if we can line ourselves up with that plan, I mean, we'll see God doing a work in our marriages. And I know, I know that there's a lot of marriages out there struggling. There's probably some marriages in here struggling. And like I told you, when we started this series a couple of weeks ago on marriage, that, that if you tried it every other way, and it just doesn't seem to be working. Maybe you need to try it God's way. Let's line it up with God's plan and will for marriage. Amen. Amen. Listen, church, if you would, please stand. I'm going to open up a time of invitation. We're going to be finishing a little bit early this morning. Um, that's kind of intentional. Nikki and I have a memorial service that we have to be at uh, pretty early this afternoon. But I want to give you the time. I want to give plenty of time this morning. All right? You've got plenty of time.
If the Lord has ministered or spoke to your heart in any way this morning, whatever that may be, I want to encourage you. Get with Him this morning on it. If you're struggling in your marriage, if there's been some things happening and going on in your marriage and you know that God is trying to trying to, to line it up with His will and His plan for marriage this morning, I, I encourage you to come forward, come to the altar and lay it down before God and say, God, I want Your will and Your plan for my marriage. God, I want You to save my marriage. I want You to do for me what I cannot do on my own. Would you come this morning? Maybe you're here this morning and you realize that your relationship with God isn't where it needs to be. Maybe you're not lined up with the will and plan for God's for your life that God has for you. And you realize this morning that God's calling you back and He's wanting you to recommit yourself to Him today. Is that you this morning? Would you come? Would you come and lay it down at the altar this morning and get it right with God? I'm telling you, if that relationship, that horizontal, that vertical relationship, if it's not right, if it's not where it needs to be with God, then that then everything that is happening horizontally in relationships is going to be affected by that. Would you come this morning? If you're here this morning and you don't even know what it is to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, maybe you've never received Christ Jesus as your Lord. Would you come see me this morning? Let's talk about it. Because there's a plan that God has put in place for salvation, and that is by grace through faith and the receiving and acceptance of that free gift of salvation through Christ Jesus. Listen, I can tell you all about it. Would you come this morning? The invitation is open. Cody's going to play through this song. I'll be standing off to the side here if you want prayer. I'll pray with you if you want to just come forward and get along with God. I want to encourage you to do so. And if you just want to get along with God where you're at, that's, that's between you and God. But the invitation is open. Every arm that is broken.
Amen, church. You may be seated. All right. So next week, you may want to have your children in here. We're going to talk about um, parents and children uh, next week. So um, listen, I, I just want to say that, uh, listen, that God is not done, okay? Amen. He's not done with you individually. He's not done with us corporately, okay? God's looking to do a work in our lives. And I heard a preacher saying this morning that we need to come with expectation. Amen. We need to come expecting God to move, okay? Yes. Knowing that He can and He will, yes. right? When we seek Him. Jesus says, ask, seek, and knock, right? If we ask, it will be given to us. If we seek, we will find. If we knock, the door will be open to us. Listen, we have to come in faith. Amen? Amen. 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 So.